Hi, good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. Hope you had a wonderful break, that you took time to recover, to de-stress. And um, as it happens, this is the topic today, or we'll continue from where we left off before break. So remember we talked about the idea that, in fact, stress wasn't the problem, which was the most interesting, surprising, but in retrospect, obvious finding of the research on stress, that stress in and of itself is actually good. Just like in athletics, just like in sports, when we stress a muscle, the muscle develop, it grows. When we stress ourselves psychologically, emotionally, we grow, we become more resilient, we become stronger. It is not good for a person who is just born to be put in a sterile environment and be protected from all the stresses of the outside world, such as bacteria, for example, which stresses the system because it forces it to create antibodies. It's not good for us to be in a sterile environment, not physically, whether it's in a, in a closed environment as babies, not physically in terms of not doing any sports, not pushing ourselves, and also not mentally and emotionally, which is why I said, you know, time and again, I wish that you fail more, because I think it is important to go through hardships, through difficulties. And in fact, we're going to talk about failure right after we finish up with a goal-setting lecture when we discuss perfectionism, which is all about our approach toward failure. So stress is not the problem. The problem is lack of recovery, and that is what we don't have enough of in our culture not just at Harvard. In most workplaces, there is not enough place for recovery. In most schools, most universities, which explains why levels of stress translate themselves to chronic stress, translate themselves to chronic anxiety, translate themselves to depression. It's because we don't have the recovery. And we talked about recovery on a few levels. So just a quick recap. We talked about recovery on the micro level, which is for example, every 90 minutes of sprint, 15 minutes break. Instead of being marathon runners, being sprinters. It's a 15 minute meditation. It's a one hour lunch where we really give ourselves time to recover. It's going to the gym on a regular basis. It's the 15 minute listening to our favorite piece of music speaking to a friend or whatever it is. The recovery on the micro level and people who recover who have recoveries during their work day. And this is research done across the river by people like Teresa Amabile or Leslie Perlow. Show how important it is in the workplace to have recoveries. And people who do it are more productive, more creative, and in the long term, also happier. Higher levels of job satisfaction. Recovery also on the metro level, the full night sleep. The day off during once a week at least time off, recreate so that we can create. And finally, the vacations, holidays, longer periods. You see, the other thing that happens when we're constantly on the run is that we miss the beauty that's all around us and within us. We miss the real potential for happiness for joy, for appreciation that surrounds us day in and day out. And that's why we take things for granted, because we don't take the time to appreciate, to savor. And it's not natural to do so. I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine a lion living in our modern world? Can you imagine a lion um, working at McKinsey or in investment banking? or being on the tenure track. It's unnatural. You know, what a lion needs to do is yawn. They need to play. It is natural. And remember what we talked about during the first couple of lectures, the constraint view of human nature. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed. Our nature dictates that we need recovery. All animals do. 
And when we frustrate a psychological, physical need, we pay a price for it. Whether it's the need for recovery or the need for physical exercise or the need for certain vitamins or protein, we pay a price for it. And the key is to introduce these natural recovery periods into our lives. And here is the key. The key is focus. Focus on both work as well as recovery. So remember the question that we asked before break. What makes some individuals succeed despite living in the modern world or living with ambition and success? Well, these individuals know how to focus when they work and when they play. To use the cliche, they work hard and they play hard. What does that mean specifically? First of all, in recovery, they understand that quantity affects quality. Let me share with you a study that you read about in, in the book. This is by Nobel uh, Prize winner, the Israeli psychologist um, Daniel Kahneman, won a Nobel Prize for economics, turned positive psychologist. What he wanted to understand was the effect of the emotional experiences of women during the day. And what he did was ask women to evaluate their experiences right after they had that particular experience. So what was it like for you? And they evaluated their experience at work, they evaluated their experience shopping, they evaluated their experience spending time with their um, intimate partners, with their children, having lunch with friends, whatever it was. They evaluated how they were doing during the day. And the most surprising finding of this result was that these women did not particularly enjoy time they spent with their kids. Now, this result was very surprising to Kahneman, and when he probed further, he and his uh, co-authors, it wasn't the fact that the women didn't love their kids. I mean, they loved their kids. For most of these women, kids were the most meaningful, important thing in their lives. However, their experience with their kids often was not pleasurable. The second component of happiness. Very meaningful, but not always pleasurable. Why? When they probed further, they found out exactly why. Because these women, when they were with their kids, they were not really with their kids. Meaning, they were on the phone at the same time, or doing email, or thinking about what they, had, what they did earlier at work, or what they have to do later at home. They were distracted, and they were not present with their kids. Now, individually, discreetly, they may have really enjoyed being on the phone with a friend, or doing work, or thinking about work, or thinking about what they have to do later. Each discreet individual activity may have been a lot of fun, but together it was too much of a good thing. And quantity affects quality. I mean, think about the following analogy. Think about the following analogy. Think about your favorite piece of music, and listening to it with your eyes closed and focused. So, your favorite piece of music, if it's like mine, probably is, it's Whitney Houston's and I Will Always Love You. Thank you, yes, there's another one here, with good taste in music. And you listen to Whitney Houston, or whatever your favorite piece of music is, your eyes close and you focus, and then you rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. And of course, perfect 10, you're touched, you're moved, you're inspired. And then you listen to your second most favorite piece of music, which, if it is like mine, it's the chorus piece from Beethoven's Ninth. And you listen to it, you focus on it, and again you rate it on a scale of 1 to 10, not quite, and I will always love you, but it's a nine and a half. And then, and then, for maximal effect, you take the two pieces together and play them. And what do you get? A 19 and a half, right? No, not a 10, not even a 5. It's noise. This is modern life for you. This is modern life. We have activities, we have so many wonderful things in our lives, but we have too many of them. And you know what that often does? It very often leads to guilt and frustration. Why? Because I say to myself, how is that possible? I love doing what I'm doing. 
I'm so fortunate to have so many amazing, wonderful things, people, experiences in my life, and yet I fail to be happy. There must be something wrong with me. No, there's nothing wrong with you. It's perfectly natural. Just like you will not be able to enjoy the two pieces of music played together, even though individually they're your two most favorite pieces of music. Too much of a good thing. Quantity does affect quality. Now, this happens constantly. It happened to me two years ago when I was teaching positive psych. It was about one month into the semester, and it just didn't make sense to me. Why wasn't I happy? The class was doing well. I was enjoying the class. I was doing a lot of work, consulting. I was speaking around the country about positive psychology, about Israel. I was writing and doing all the things that I love, that I care about, that I'm passionate about. Spending time with my family. And then I took a step back and I realized too much of a good thing. And as soon as I cut the activities, happiness level went back up again. Quantity affects quality. Researchers on relationships and love, the Hendricks couple, say, love and sex are affected negatively by stress. If we can help people to simplify their lives, thus reducing their stress levels, it is very likely that people's relationships would be enriched greatly. Moreover, the positive aspects of their lives would be enriched accordingly. It affects every area of our lives, whether it's our love life, whether it's our experience with our kids, whether it's our experience doing work or reading, spending time with friends, or writing. There can be too much of a good thing. So if we have lunch, and we use lunch as, as recovery, and at the same time we're on the phone and doing email, that's not recovery, that's simply more stress. But if we have just lunch and focus on our eating and enjoy it, or just spend time with people we love, that's recovery. The key is focus. The same thing applies to work. Now, it's not possible in our world today, certainly not in leadership positions, which many of you have already got and will assume in the future, it's not possible to eliminate multitasking. The key, though, is to reduce it. Just a quick show of hands, how many people here, while you're doing work that requires concentration, that requires focus, whether it's writing or re doing reading or anything else that requires concentration, how many people here have their emails on at the same time? Okay, it's the majority, it's most people in, in the West that, who do that. I used to do that too until I found out about this research. When you have your email on while you're doing work that requires concentration, it is equivalent to taking off 10 IQ points. 10 IQ points. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't spare 10 IQ points. Now, for comparison's sake, if you lose a whole night's sleep, so if you haven't slept for 36 hours, your IQ is reduced by the equivalent of 10 points. 